Welcome to the After Hours Podcast, hosted by Harry Haas and James Friedlender, presented by My Investing Club. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Today, we have Nick, who's uh, been a member of MIC for about six months. Uh, we had reached out to a bunch of different members, and we wanted to kind of get people on, hear their journey. Um, and I think it's really helpful because we, as people who aren't in the group, uh, hear these stories and I hope it encourages them to kind of join and you know see kind of like the positive uh, positive flow that we're putting out here so Nick thank you for coming on um, we really appreciate having you hey, no problem thanks for having me of course of course man so obviously an old-fashioned um, do you want to give us a little bit of background about yourself uh, and then eventually how you kind of came to find MIC uh, and go we'll go from there yeah, so my name is Nick. Um, I've uh, uh, started day trading uh, about a year and a half ago, um, about 40 years old. And um, anyways, uh, I first started with a, uh, another group. And uh, as I got, you know, delving further into day trading, um, very, became very serious with it. Um, I ran across MIC, obviously started uh, following Bao, started following Alex. Um, and they're just seeing what they were putting out there. I really liked uh, what they were putting out there and, you know, the, the YouTube videos and, and then bow, you know, I mean, that guy, the stuff he posts on his uh, on social media uh, <laughs> keeps you laughing as well. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anyways, um, about six months ago, um, I, uh, I started with MIC um, when I initially uh, signed up, uh, I signed up for the annual membership, uh, figured, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm in day trading. I'm, you know, this is something I'm passionate about, serious about learning. And uh, so I jumped in the annual membership. Um, once I got into the MIC, into the group, um, you know, saw the commentary, just the, just, you know, MIC in general, you know, all the mods, you know, you, Harry, Tosh, I mean, you name it, Alex, Bao. I mean, what everybody does, I mean, um, I was, I was really kind of taken back by it about how much effort all the mods yeah. really put in to the group and trying to mentor and educate and get people, you know, keep people on track. Um, and so once I got in, it didn't take me long. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, joining the uh, lifetime membership. And Love so that. that's when I uh, upgraded to lifetime. So that's, that's basically, you know, thus far I've been in day trading about a year and a half. Um, I'm still not, you know, a CPT by any means, I'm still have my ups, my downs. Yeah, of course. So that's kind of where I'm at in my journey right now. That's so cool. How did you even, how are, did you, or, uh, go ahead, yeah. Harry, go okay. Ahead. I was just gonna, um, you know, maybe dive into like what kind of, uh, strategies you kind of like started with and like, maybe, cause like, we can always like turn this podcast into like, uh, you know, if you have any questions or like, you know, talk about like what you're struggling with, um, and things like that, like if you want, um, mm -hmm. but also like we could also talk about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what kind of strategies you're using now and what kind of like, uh, you know, struggles you faced and what kind of like, what you, we can talk about like your ups and also, you know, downs as well. Um, so I don't know if you want to kind of uh, dive in about that. Yeah, so um, since I've started um, day trading, um, I primarily, I would say, uh, mostly uh, just been a, a short seller, being on the short side. Um, for whatever reason, it just, I don't know, my, my way my brain works, <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it, uh, it, it seems to favor me. Um, as of recent, though, I've started looking at different setups, you know, looking at different setups and, you know, looking at a stock that maybe I was initially wrong at on the short side and just started looking at the trend and figure, you know what, maybe I'll start, uh, you know, positioning, you know, in a long position here. And so I have been trying to, especially in this current market, I've been trying to kind of expand my playbook a little bit and not just be so one-sided um, on stocks. Um, one thing that I have you know, since I've joined MIC in the last six months, the biggest thing that I have like done for me that has been very, very beneficial for me is again, you guys preach, you know, have a, have a, you know, max stop loss and auto liquidation with the broker. Um, and also look at your levels, look at you, you know, plan your entries um, and see where you're going to stop out at. 
Yeah. And that has saved me tremendously because prior to MIC, I had some great days um, trading, um, but I had some, I had some very bad days because I had no risk management. And so yeah. my P and L swings were like, you know, they were super, you know, up and down and, you know, again, emotions come into play, nerve wracking. And, and it was something that there for a little bit, I was like, eh, I was kind of questioning um, whether it was truly for me or not. Um, so since joining MIC, I have definitely um, improved my risk management. Um, it's huge. And I mean, it's, it's super huge. And, and, and I would say there are times that I have struggled. Uh, one thing that I have struggled with is the fact that sometimes when I would get into a position, I would scale into position. You know, yep. I would be, um, you know, based off my, you know, position and sizing, like I could be down like 1500 to two grand. Yeah. And then all Are you small sudden, caps? Are you trading yeah. small caps mostly? Yeah, I, I primarily trade small caps, although recently, as of this month, I've actually been dabbling in the large caps, just okay. based off of the current market conditions. Um, cool. But given the small caps and so forth, like, you know, I'd be down, you know, a, a, you know, maybe a couple grand. And then all of a sudden, you know, obviously it would, you know, sell off and I would be a solid green yeah. Yeah. Um, and scale, you know, and cover on out of it. And, and now the where I have my max stop loss, I have it set in a very, very, you know, comfortable stop to where if I hit it, it's like, eh, like that sucks. You never want to hit it, but it's also like, eh, I'm not really concerned about it. I can, you know, shut my computers down and go about my day and not really be mentally affected by it. Yeah. yeah. Although, although it is making me, I've had challenges with is becoming more of a, you know, sniper on my entries because when I want to get in a certain size that I'm used to, if I don't get in at the right times, I'm stopping yeah, out. You kind of missed that ad. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so that's something that I'm kind of struggling with personally is it's helping me, I'm sure in the long run, but it's also kind of limiting. It, it, as of right now, it's limiting me in kind of my, my profits so to speak. Yeah, I think it's tough because I think there's like a huge misconception between a lot of MIC members too of like, there's a difference between like scalping and like scaling versus like more of like the one shot, one kill idea and like, like entries in general, right? And like, I feel like with scalping, there's multiple ways to do it. It's like, you could either like, I like, like if you're really scaling, I like Bao's method a lot actually because he uses like smaller size. And when I say small size, it's relative, right? Like he might use like a thousand shares per bullet but like for him, that's like small size, but he'll scale a lot, right? And he'll know that his average, he always will know kind of where his average is going to be. But what makes Bao so successful is that he also scales out. So like he might scale into a position, have like a good average, not amazing, but he's comfortable with that size in the range to where he stops out, right? Like, so for me, like, I'm not comfortable with that. I like his method. I just, I'm not comfortable with being down that much anymore right like especially as you try to size up it gets harder and harder and then you could scale like alex alex is like three bullets but what makes alex so special is that he knows when he's got the balls to size in when that right moment hits right again not doesn't really work for me that great i don't have that for me i've transitioned to very much to more of like a i almost am like a one shot one kill kind of guy with a set risk now, because like you were saying, like you found yourself down at certain points and, and, you know, you've set your net, now your max loss to like a, a reasonable level that you're comfortable with. But like, like I wasn't comfortable being down that much, especially as you try to use bigger size. So it's not easy. Like, I think that everything that you're feeling is like a, a natural growing pain with trading. And it's just kind of now finding, you know, where your next best entry is going to be. Cause you can do both, right? Like you can scale in slowly, but there does come that point where it'll, it'll be hard to become profitable if you don't get on, I don't want to say get on that size, but if you don't get on that next kind of entry, because that's where the bulk of your money is going to come from, right? You'll have those small losses from scaling in, but you need those big wins to counteract it. And Austin did a, a webinar on this where you need to get on your size at some point. You mm -hmm. need trades with max. I don't want to say max size because max size is a stupid term that's thrown around way too much. Like just whatever size you're allocated for that setup, whatever you need to do that. You need to have those trades or else you'll always just kind of be in limbo. Like I did that for a long time where like, I'd have like, like small loss, small win, small loss, 
big loss, small win, you know, and then that's, so, so it is something to work on and, it, and it's not easy, you know? Yeah. And I found, I found myself that, you know, in that same predicament as well, where, you know, sometimes my losses are bigger than my, are larger yeah. than my wins. Yep. And I've also found too, that if like, for example, I scale in a position, it's going against me. It's, it, you know, it, it went past my range uh, where I, where I was anticipating based off of my lines. When I, when I cover out and take those, take those losses, uh, when I, when I do cover out a position, one thing I've tried to do is I've like maybe taken half off and then re add higher. Um, you know, I've tried to do that at times where, you know, if I see a certain, a, another level, maybe just above, I'll, I'll try to, you know, hit that area. But one thing I've found is that when I do take those initial loss on a stock and, and they're not small, but I mean, they're not, they're not large, but it, what it does is I think it kind of affects me mentally. So when I do get back into that stock at another line, I have found myself not getting back in the same share size. I've been getting back in smaller. And then it because does what I expect it to do. And then I'm like, oh, sweet. I just, it did what I expected, but my loss was larger than my win. Yeah. So I, I talked about this in a video I just made uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's, I heard it from another trader, actually. And I really liked the concept. And it's just, you need to, as a trader, in my opinion, and I'm sure people will find it, will differ their opinions on it, but you need to have, consistency in your losses like you like something i've changed going into 2022 is like if i if i post all my pnls and after hours of all my losses of the year which thankfully you're gonna knock on wood isn't that, that many but they're all but they're all similar they're all around they're pretty much within a hundred dollars of each other right to account for like slippage or whatever but they're all about the same so that way i know when the trade does go my way i'm totally comfortable with that because if on the way up you lose a thousand dollars, but like your average winners are only like five, six hundred dollars. You're never going to get the confidence to hold on to that trade for the next line or for like the area to get out of. And that's the problem. So like as a, as a new guy, I wish I, rem I learned this early on, find consistency in the losses and that will help you also get a better entry because you know, you're going to take a certain like dollar loss on the trade. You kind of know where you have to get in. You know what your average has to be on that position. So that way you're not taking a massive loss. Like again, when Alex scales, like people always say like Alex scales pretty wide. Cause he can, you go like, like on, um, forget that stock the other day, uh, DCFC, he was scaling like dollars, yes. right? Because he knew no matter what, if he hit his three to four bullets where his average was, if it went to his stop area, he was comfortable with that loss. Because he also knows that when it does turn, he could get back in, size into what he wants to, and make it all back. But too many people, and, and Harry, I'm sure you can account for this, because I feel like longs probably do this too, is that yeah. you take too many losses before the trade actually happens. Yeah. And again, if you're, if you're taking a $200 loss, then a $600 loss, then a $200 loss, by the time the trade turns, you're like, well, fuck, I'm only going to make half of it back. I'm going to scalp out of this, like mega scalp. And that's, that was my problem for like years, actually, was... I would be okay and I would keep a small loss on the front side, but then I just wanted to make the money back as soon as possible. So I would like kind of scalp out of it. Whereas now that I've found consistent consistency in my losses, I know if I take two cuts on the way up, I don't really care that much because I know I'm going to make all that money back plus probably double if my trade thesis actually plays out correctly. Yeah. And I also think as far as, uh, well, I think um, as far as like that kind of scaling goes, you have to, uh, I think in every trade, you have to have some type of thesis, right? And so maybe for me, it's like, I think over this breakout level, the stock's going to rip, right? Or I think, um, you know, I think over high of day, they're going to clear the stock out and bring it back to lows. Or I think that 350 whole number is going to reject, right? And so I think that, and I was thinking about this the other day, everyone had like everyone has their kind of like anticipation size. So whether it's like the 30% over VWAP, like MIC teaches, or maybe you're like, okay, I'm going to put some on a little bit before this level. Cause you know, it's like that FOMO size, right? Where, um, you know, you put some on before it actually happens. And I think that that's really key too. And then just adding into the confirmation because like so many people are getting full size before they're even proven right. 
Like I was talking to a guy the other day, he was longing a broken stock. And I was like, I mean, that's okay. You can long broken stocks. Like it's not the most profitable strategy, but like one in every like 20, I'm sure rip or one in every 30. Like, and so I, I asked him like, well, how much size do you have on? He's like, oh, well, I was full size. And I was like, well, how are you full size on a broken stock that's fading? You know, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same thing, you know, on front side, like, you know, let's say you're, you're thinking $2 is going to reject. Well, it's okay to put a little bit of size on before two for your kind of like anticipation size. And then when you're confirmed, just add it in, you know, it's the same thing with scaling. The reason why I'm not the biggest fan of scaling and some people have mastered scaling like Alex, you know, even about to, uh, you know, but the reason why I don't necessarily love it is because for me as a long trader, um, it was like, I was just anticipating the whole thing and kind of like hoping, you know, like, and I found myself struggling with that mentally where it's like, okay, like I know the stock is going to bounce eventually. Right. But I need to be sized in, in the right area in order for me to make money on the bounce trade or else you're just going to bounce like halfway and you're not really going to make money. Right. And so that's what I kind of said to myself, like, why aren't I, uh, putting all the size where I think it's going to bounce rather than just having two FOMO bullets. And I'm like, I know it's probably not going to bounce here, but it's worth it, you know? And that's what I kind of struggled with. Like, if I have an idea, like, I'm not afraid to go one shot, one go, because, you know, it's my, my, you know, idea, you know? And so I think that there is kind of a big, uh, like a lot of people, the problem is, is that I think we, we do recommend scaling because people, we're getting in way too early. You know, they were getting in, like, let's say if their trading plan was to get in at VWAP, they would get in like 20 cents below VWAP, the VWAP projection would come. And then they'd be like, you know, crying about it to all of us. And we were like, yeah. you know, the scaling is really for design for FOMO, I think. You know, it's designed, it's really designed for FOMO. But if you don't have a problem with FOMO and you're just willing to wait, in my opinion, what's the point of scaling? And that was really the battle I had with myself is that like, um, okay, like, it, like, and I mean, just to me, it was like, I know this is going to bounce at, let's say 230. That is my idea. So why aren't I taking a little bit of a fantasy into 230 in case it just hits 230 and snaps up to 250 or 260 right away? you know, why, why don't I put a little bit of size in front of that and then add when I'm right and then just sell into the pop, right? That sounds way simpler to me. That's what kind of makes sense to me uh, as far as kind of scaling goes. I agree. I th think, I think I get a lot of DMs about scaling as well. And like people say, or like if they're struggling with like the 30% rule um, and for people who don't know the 30% rule is basically it when you shorting or longing, I guess, but mostly what I'm talking about shorting is 30% of your size can be used on the front side of the move. So whether you're scaling, whether it's like front side, it's kind of like you're like feeler, et cetera. But the problem with that is you also, you can scale in with that, but you need to be willing to throw on the rest of your size when you think the trade is now confirmed or working because that's 70% of your size or the rest of your size or call it 50, 60%, whatever is going to bring your average to like where you want it to, I suppose. And like, and that's the problem is like, if you're always just only scaling 30%, you're never going to have like sizable P and L's that will like make up the difference of the losses. So, and if you're struggling to kind of put on the rest of your size, then I just think right at this moment, I'm not talking about you, Nick, I'm just talking in general. Um, as a trader, I think you lack the confidence to throw on the size because you don't have the, you don't have the confidence in the setup yet. So I think if you're, if you're a trader who's struggling to put on the size that he intends for that trade, like if you're allocating a thousand shares for position, I mean, you're, you want to get on your thousand shares for a reason. So you need to make sure you have confidence in your setup and it has to be like back tested and like understood that when a trade is backside, this is how much range it provides. This is how much profit I could make if, when it goes my way. That's the only way I think you can scale successfully is, is if you're willing to kind of do those things. And, and I would I would agree with myself personally is that <clears throat> there's been times where I've had a lot of confidence in my setups and I have put it on I have put on larger size and it's worked out great for me. Um, although there has been times where I'm like oh yeah I feel very confident in this and I didn't have 
rules in place, you yeah. know, as far as a hard stop or anything like that, it's ripped against me. And that completely like, you know, you know, I would say for future trades and kind of where I'm at right now with the way the market has been going, I have been a little um, talking myself out of certain areas to really scale in, you know, yeah. where, you know, I need, okay, hey, this is a good spot here where I have a good average. I need to put some size on and I talk myself out of it and it ends up doing exactly what I thought it would do. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. Please, you, right, you know cool. I, yeah. I know you, you know what I've learned too is like it's something that really helped me uh like recently especially is like when I mentioned kind of finding consistency in your losses is like you can kind of use as much size as you want if you know the what kind of loss you're going to take right like I think the fear of using like sizing into a position and I, I'm not saying like go like mega like big whale dick size I'm just talking about like using the size you you want to use for that setup like I think the fear and it, I know that was like it for me was that you're just afraid of with a potential loss. Like if you try to use 5,000 shares and you don't have a hard stop in, like the loss could technically be as big as you as it could get. I mean, until you stop out or until your broker enforces the loss. But like now for me, it's like, I know like what I'm risking per trade. So like no matter what, I could use 50,000 shares if I wanted to. And I know what my loss will be because I'm always yeah. using that hard stop at that level that I want to get out at. So I think everyone who's struggling with this concept, it's like, find the confidence in your setups. And like, honestly, if you don't have confidence yet, then you, in my opinion, aren't putting in enough work at looking at charts because charting and fit technical analysis, like what MIC teaches a lot of is very simplistic. Like when the backside is in, it's in my opinion, it's kind of easy to tell. It's kind of easy to tell when a stock turns and the top is set. And it's like, it's again, nothing is hundred percent in the market. It's not proven, but it's easy to recognize. So once you learn that talent of recognizing backside is in momentum has shifted when Harry is done selling and Harry's like, all right, I'm walking away. And Austin's long sells are, are out. You know, when it's time that longs are done. So that's when you have to find the confidence to size in set a hard stop. I mean, most brokers allow hard stops to like 50,000 shares. So if you're using less than 50,000 shares and you're not using a hard stop, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand what you're doing, right? You need to yeah. know what you're going to lose if you're wrong. You need to base your stop off the chart. And then from there, I think finding the confidence to size in uh, comes a lot more naturally. Yeah. And I think also like uh, I was, uh, I was reading this, someone had posted in main chat like the other day and they were like, man, like I, I, I piked and I was like, don't worry about it. You know, in my opinion, um, Sorry, I don't know if you can hear the truck that's like backing up out there, but like, no. oh, okay. okay. Well, where, I, where I live, like there's like a, a sushi restaurant downstairs and a couple other restaurants. So like- It's a Canadian truck right now. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think I'm going to get sushi for lunch actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, so anyway, he, he messaged me in and he, or he didn't message me. He just posted in the main chat like, oh, like, um, you know, I piked today. Uh, oh, like that's crazy. In my opinion, scalping is really designed to like build your account until you're ready for the next level to hold longer, right? There, we have some guys who hold like literally all day, but they started with scalping in order to develop that market experience, right? So everyone starts at level one and they're like, oh, I want to be like level 100. I want to do this. I want to do that. But it's like, no, what you should do is scalp, grow your account learn some things about the market, learn some things about yourself, find your personality. And then when the time comes, you know, expand into holding a bit longer and expand into, you know, getting better. And someone commented below and was like, well, what if the market shifts or what if this or what if that? It's like, if you have true edge, okay, you would have piked like 10 to 20 times in a row right? Like me missing uh, BKKT. I'm pretty sure I was the first person to even talk about that stock inside MIC, where I was like, oh, looking at uh, 460. You know, it's at eight bucks now. But to me, that was like one pike for me out of, uh, I don't know, like it was like one pike out of like everything else could have been scalps, right? Like everything else was a fine trade. Everything else I did right. Everything else I sold at the right area. This one runs day, it doesn't really bother me, right? But if I have 10 to 20 stocks run to eight bucks, you're sure as shit I'm gonna be holding, right? You have the confidence to hold longer 
in that type of situation. So that's why I kind of disagree with people who are like, oh, like, you know, he should have held or he should have done this or he should have done that. It's like, no, just take the money right now because right now you're just developing experience. Right now you're just getting better, you know? But if you do have true edge with the holding strategy, like your scalps will be piped like 20 to 30 times in a row. Um, and so that's what I mean. Like there's no problem with like learning a new strategy and treating it as a scalp and then looking at what happens after the fact and tracking down and saying, okay, well, this stock went to eight bucks or this stock went to five bucks or this stock went to three bucks. And when you get a lot of those in a row, then in my opinion, that's okay to hold longer. But, you know, all these guys who are like, you know, I want to be this, I want to be that. It's like master scalping first, you know, master, get some time and get some experience in with the market because like, you know, it takes time. Uh, to kind of develop what you're good at, to find your personality. Like Nick may be a crazy view app projection short trader, you know? And uh, we were talking about that last night, James, where I was explaining, um, you know, how float really does kind of affect the stock. And, you know, if you're looking to short a view app replay on a higher float stock, it's going to be a lot easier because like the higher, the the thicker the float, you know, it's like, putting your hand in a peanut butter jar, you know, versus putting your hand in, in some water, right? The water is a lot thinner and the water is kind of acting as the low float, whereas like kind of that peanut butter jar acts as a thicker float. But what I was trying to kind of get at is just like, you know, everyone's good at something different. And in my opinion, until you find that, uh, people shouldn't be looking for home runs and people should be just you know, coming up with their own kind of trade ideas, coming up with their own kind of thesis, you know, putting a little bit of size into that, that level or that idea, and then adding one right. And that's probably the simplest way to do it, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so, too. I think, I think there's also a difference between, like, being a scalper and, like, there's a massive difference, actually, between being a scalper and, like, being, like, a piker. Like, piker is such a broad term because, like, you could – you could hold for a massive move and still miss a big chunk of it and be like, oh, fuck, I piked that move or whatever. Like, scalping is like, that's like a personality trait for a lot of people. It's like, they like to get in, they like to get out. But people like on Twitter and stuff, they like to miss, uh, miss like, I don't know the right word, I guess. Like, they just, they, yeah, like they, they, they talk about scalping. Like, it's like, oh, I'm in five cents, I'm out five cents. I'm in five cents, I'm out five cents. Like, that's not it. Like, scalping in like that words of like MIC and like with Alex and Bao is like, you're just trading line to line. You're just going support to resistance. So if resistance and support are 10 cents away, sure. But most of the time it's like 30, 40 cents away. So that is like scalping. Like I think people pike out of positions because it comes back to confidence. Like they don't have confidence in the setup. Like if you're someone who's still like getting into a scalp, like if you scale into a position and then you scalp right out of it because you're like, you just want to lock in profit. It's because you still lack confidence in that setup. So it all, I think in my opinion, it all comes back to that. It's just like until you, you find um, where your edge is in trading, you're always going to kind of be in that like break even stage of like loss, loss, small win, small win, random big win, random fucking huge loss, big huge, like all that stuff. So to me, that's kind of the difference between the two. And, you know, Nick, I don't know like where you're kind of like right now for you as a trader, you know, what is it causing like the biggest headache because i think we've kind of touched on this topic a lot but what's causing the biggest headache for you kind of like to progress i would say in in that and so i do i kind of like how and and where i'm currently at right now is i do like bows trading style because um as far as getting in and getting out um you know 20 30 40 cents or whatever um and based off my size and stuff that's that's okay with me because you know i trade style I, I tr- it's, it's kind of fits my personality. Um, yep. I'm not the, you know, the hold and wait all day long and see what this thing does. I don't have that time. Um, you know, like I have a very yep. busy job, a uh, very busy career, you know? And, and so there's, I can't be focused on, Oh shoot. I wonder what that stock's doing as I'm trying to yep. go about my day with work because otherwise my mind's just not in it. And so I have found myself that, Hey, you know what? Market open, um, market open, I'll have my, I'll have my line set, um, see what the stock does. And if it drops 20, 30, 40, 50 cents, I'm out. And by, you know, before, you know, 1030 and that's my goal every day. And then I get my day started. 
So what I have what I have learned is that 1030 rule is again, <laughs> I know you guys say it, everybody says it in MIC. I mean, and I will say it, it is, I mean, statistically speaking, the 1030 rule is 100. I mean, it, it's it's very, very high percentage that the stocks will, rip, you know, they're not going to go lower at that point. Some do, you know, some will come back up and, you know, fade off through the rest of the day. But for me, you know, with my work schedule and with just how my mind works, um, I'm out. One thing I have tried to do, though, um, and this is in the last few months, is I found myself scaling out too quick, you know, covering out of my position too quick. So, you know. I scale in, it goes 20, 30, 40 cents down. And I'm like, you know, I'd be all out. I'm like, sweet, that was a win, which it is. Although I would look back at the stock later on or, you know, fast forward another 30 minutes and it dumped another 30, 40 cents. Yeah. And so one thing I have been trying to do is I will, if I have a good entry, you know, good average and the stock does um, do what I, you know, what I plan for it to do, and it's gone down and I've covered out. I tried to cover out about 75% of my um, shares mm -hmm. and leave on another quarter uh, for a break even or see if it comes down a little bit more. Um, yep. And so that's what I've been trying to do as of recent. It, it has been helping. Um, but I would say that was my biggest issue is what, what, one of my issues. <laughs> I still have multiple, but um, yeah. is... Uh, is taking off my profits too quickly and then watching the stock plummet and going, oh, yeah. that's, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think there's like two things with that. Cause it's like, some people might look at that as like being greedy, right? They're like, oh, look at once your, your support level, like take it nail and bail, take the money. But also at the same time, like if you're trying to grow your PLs, like some, something a few guys like I've talked to have, have mentioned they do and it seems to work well is like they've installed like a button on their DOS. Like I know I did it, something similar that like almost is like a FOMO cover. So it's like, mm -hmm. if you're in just for example, a thousand shares, that FOMO cover might be like a hundred shares. But like weirdly enough, like our brains, like it's almost like a fear of losing all the money. So it's like sometimes just taking off that baby cover, mm -hmm. like that little tiny amount, like does just like scratch the itch. And then you can hold for like your actual move, right? But again, yeah. it's like if a stock does go to your support level, like mm. that's where you get out. There's a reason yeah. for it, right? I mean, there's a reason why like Alex like preaches like nail and bail because most of the time, if it gets to a support level, it's probably going to bounce from there, right? So it's like, again, it's all it's a, it's a tough, uh, it's a fine line to walk because like, are you being greedy? Or are you trying to grow your PL because you're missing part of the move? If, if you nail the move, in my opinion, for 99% of people, take the money and walk and that's it. But if you're just trying to hold longer, there's so many little like methods you can do. Again, cover like a tiny bit, leave the rest on. Like sometimes like what I like to do is like I'll cover um, just enough to cover like what my loss would be if my trade goes against me and wrong. So then it's just a break even trade, but I still hold size. Sometimes I like what Austin does. Like Austin covers like a bulk of his at his line. Like if you look at his trades, Austin will always take off a bulk of his trade at his desired exit. But then he leaves on like, another 25% for like home run stuff. And he just lets it go as far as it can. And that's it. And then that that's, I like how he does it. Cause it's just, again, it's, he's not, he's not shooting for a home run, but there's always a potential for a home run, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, and that's something that I look at of, you know, potentially trying out as well, where, you know, because you go back, you know, throughout the day, maybe I'll look at, Hey, that, that, um, that ticker that I was in on, you know, had a good move, made money on it. And then I look at it later in the day and I see like, it just plummeted, you know, even yeah. more. And I'm yeah. like, Dude, why didn't I just leave on, you know, uh, a quarter of my position and then yeah. put a, you know, a stop in, you know, where again, maybe uh, I, I, I don't make as much or a break even trade and then just let it play out the rest of the day and whatever happens, happens. Yeah. And yeah, so that's something that I- little extra so, yeah, sometimes that little extra profit will go a long way because that will make up for those small losses later on. You know, like it's it's a good it's a good talent and to uh, it's a good muscle to to work. And it, all it is is a muscle. Like Tosh, I used to talk to him all the time about this. Like it's just a reflex. Like leaving a little bit on just for like a little bit lower takes time, and you just have to start small. You know, if you use a thousand shares, start leaving on a hundred shares. 
then leave on 150, 200, 250, so on and so forth. And, and it does get easier over time. You know, it's a, it's a muscle, it's a reflex that you have to train. I, I, I agree with that. And that is something I'm going to start looking at doing and just, uh, just testing it out and see what the, you know, what it, what it ends up showing for, for me personally. Um, another thing that, you know, I, I know everybody deals with and for whatever reason, I, I mean, January is a pretty good month for me. Um, February so far has been a little rocky. I'm not going to lie. February is a weird um, month. The last two weeks have been challenging and been been definitely stress, uh, frustrating, especially when I go back in like my trader view and I look at last February and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. I mean, definitely two different two different months going on right now from last year to now. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think it has to do with the fact that small caps for me personally, like in the last couple of weeks, have definitely there's they've been slow. Um, you no know, range. yeah, they've been really like you know not great setups. And then I think even the setups that are there, you go to locate, and it's super expensive. Um, yep. from, and so I'm like, why am I gonna why am I gonna mess with that? And so. I started, you know, obviously getting into the large caps and some of the stuff that was uh, put out in the group. Yep. And I would say that it is a different ball game. And that's, I've done well in some and then others, you know, not so much. I don't know if I'm ever yep. going to, um, like, for example, I don't know. For me, DWAC is super, super, like, it gets me emotional um, in the <laughs> trade. Yeah, and I don't know if I'm ever going to trade DWAC again because I've lost on it twice. I'm like, why go back for the third? You know? Yeah, so. dude. Ninety percent of it, you're always better off, in my opinion. Like, I see, like, we have a chart recaps uh, section on in MIC where people post their charts, and I see traders like, like who trade small caps, but they're posting charts for like AMC DWAC and yeah. like all these other names, and it's like, dude, I guarantee you, after like a few years of being in this, like during times when the market is not ideal for you you are always, 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 always a thousand percent better off just not trading, shutting down for the day. And that's it. Like you need to set, like I, like I had to, like you have to set parameters. Like I'm not shorting anything that's not up at least 30%. And even then I almost don't even bother unless it makes a new high of day. Like I need there to be range or else I'm just not wasting my mental capital because you're going to burn all this mental capital over the next like month or so, whoever, whoever, we don't know how long this slow market time will last. It could last a year. We never yeah. know. But you could, you will burn mental capital. And then by the time the market heats up and it's your turn, you won't be able to go in gun blazing. You'll be like fucking exhausted and you'll be, yeah. you'll be confused, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I think that that's probably a good place to end it because it has been like, yep. I don't know. I know. I just, I just saw the thing. It was like an hour. 40 some minutes or something like that. But thank you, Nick. Um, yes, for coming thank on. you thank you both harry james much appreciated i appreciate all that you guys do and thank you very much for having me on perfect thanks of course so man much.